This is a production of PBS Charlotte. The following episode of Charlotte, a City of International Success is brought to you by Central Piedmont Community College and viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Dr. Maha Gingrich. Coming up next on Charlotte, a City of International Success, I will interview the one and only Dr. Robichek and Teresa Johnson. And we're going to talk about their outstanding international medical outreach program that is in Charlotte. Stay with us. Welcome to Charlotte, a city of international success. I'm Dr. Maha Gingrich. Today our guests are Dr. Francis Robichek and Teresa Johnson, and they are from International Medical Operations Program. Welcome to our show. Thank you. My pleasure. Oh, it's a pleasure is all mine, believe me, because Dr. Robichek, so many people know you. But at the same time, we do have a lot of new people coming into our region. So I would definitely would like to talk a little bit about where you're from. You're originally from Hungary? Ah, yes, I came from Hungary in 1956 to Charlotte. To Charlotte? Yes. Wow, why Charlotte? Uh, <laughs> I had an uncle who immigrated in the 20s, Andrew Roby. He cut off half of his name from Robicek to Roby. He was a contractor. And this firm is still alive. You see trucks running around Charlotte, written on them, Andrew Roby. Oh, okay. And we planned, I we planned with my wife, Lily, to spend a weekend with Uncle Andy. And we haven't seen any reason to leave. And it was in 1956. Your, what is your profession? I know you went to Budapest <clears throat> University, right, to get your medical... I, well, before I left Hungary, I was chief of cardiac surgery at the University of Budapest. And when I came to Charlotte, uh, there was a chest surgeon, Paul Sanger, who practiced with another chest surgeon, Fred Taylor. And Paul wanted to start heart surgery in Charlotte. So I started heart surgery. It was an easy, easy job because nobody was ahead of me. There was no competition. Wow. So are we saying that then the first Heart surgery happened here in Charlotte for you? Uh, we did in, in Charlotte and in Western North Carolina. Yeah. And that was a lot of other first done in the Memorial Hospital, now Carolina's Medical Center. Yeah. And I like to stay where the action was. Teresa, you are from I'm Cincinnati, from Cincinnati Ohio? Ohio. I love it. <laughs> You know, but that was a very long time ago. <laughs> when did you come to Charlotte? I came to Charlotte in the early 80s. Early 80s. And then here comes another million dollar question for me. How did you two hook up? I'm sorry, I literally use that word because when we were talking before that, and I, it's just very hard for me to see how you started working with doc, Dr. Robichak. His daughter, Suzanne, is a lawyer. My ex-husband is a lawyer, and so when I was looking for a job, she kept calling and asking me if I would come to work for her dad. And so I finally said, all right, I'll go talk to him, but I'm not making any promises. <laughs> so I went to see him and to talk to him, and um, he said, all right, I'll hire you. And I said, well, all right, I'll take the job. We sort of <laughs> acted like we were doing each other a favor at the time, but um, oh little did he know. I knew he was having, like, we called it Murphy Brown syndrome. <laughs> Nobody, he couldn't keep somebody to work for him, but it's a, it's a great fit. I mean, he's, he, you, he's a wonderful, wonderful person to work for, and I could not be more blessed, more and happy. This is years after. Yeah. I don't know who. <laughs> One day I looked up and there she was sitting at the desk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that was quite a long time ago. Yeah, I think um, in a field like where you are, um, there is more to it, even though obviously you didn't have the background, medical background. No. Obviously you got trained somehow 
He to trained be where me. you are today. He trained you. He, oh, I told him, privilege. I said, I, all I know is the head connects to the neck, the neck connects to the shoulders, <laughs> the, you know, let's turn around and clap our hands, and that's all I knew about healthcare. Wow. And, you know, he said, that's fine. We'll figure it out as we go along. So he was very patient. So he saw something in you that he knew at that point that's going to be a lifelong kind of a commitment here. Uh, at that time, I was in clinical practice of thoracic and cardiovascular surgery. So at that time we worked in the clinical field. And after I retired from clinical practice, then we continued into the field of international medical assistance, which really I have done before, but not in an organized form. Oh, okay. Now I'm doing it full time. Really talking about then, let's talk about what is you know, for short, the abbreviation is IMO, right? International, International Medical, Medical Outreach, Outreach IMO. And it's a program, IMO. So what is IMO and how did that come together? Uh, let me start a little bit at the beginning. Okay. I was always interested of working for in countries. I cannot go anywhere for a vacation. I had to do something. <laughs> so I started so to go down to, to Central America to do thoracic surgery. What is thoracic surgery? Everything between your chin and your waist is thoracic. Heart, lung, esophagus. Oh, and, uh, thank you for enlightening me today. Yeah. <laughs> and after a while working and doing clinical work, mm -hmm. I realized that we can do much more good if you don't go down there and do the job and then pack up and come home right. and don't leave anything behind. It, we can do much more if they train the locals, let them do the work and then go back with them and help them to start off a program. So I was doing this in a little bit amateurish basis. Mm -hmm. And after I retired from clinical practice, Mike Tarwater, the president of Carolina's healthcare system like tar water. came up with the idea that they provide us with deaccession medical equipment. And I always to work with the Heinemann Foundation, which is a was and still is a small private foundation in existence in the forties. Okay. And we partnered up Carolina's healthcare system with Heinemann and we receive primarily the accession equipment and Heinemann refurbish it, uh, repair it if necessary, mm -hmm. or just use it because a lot of the accession equipment is just not the latest technology. Okay. And this uh, marriage between the big healthcare system and little Heinemann worked very well. So Carolina healthcare system and Heinemann Foundation came together because Mike Tarwater had the vision, yeah, the vision. Right? right, to create this. Because you're, like you said, you're already doing this work, but you didn't really have had it in an organized form. Correct. To make it happen, that way you give itself an identity. Then that way you actually have these two organizations work together to make we, IMO. We work together in a somewhat disorganized way. Talking about heart surgeries, you did approximately 36,000 surgeries? Uh, about 35. <laughs> <laughs> Only at the, the thousand or take off. Yeah, who's counting, you know? <laughs> Not heart surgery, but major thoracic, major thoracic surgery. Surgeries. I would say about half of it was heart. Wow. Lots of heart. That, that's, that's a lot. That's, that's a, a lot. lot. So, in a field, when you're already a surgeon, okay, I mean, that is a very busy job. I mean, I have no question about that. How do you find time to do something like this? This had to be a passion. I'm looking at two different views. One is you as a surgeon finding time to actually go and do this much social work literally, and then you had no background whatsoever. You started from scratch with, obviously, 
there is a passion involved here. Tell me why you got involved in this. Because of him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think, you know, I, uh, conversations I think you and I have had maybe in the past, um, you know, everything has prepared me and led me to this point in my life. Yeah. You know, I think back about, you know, all the trials, tribulations, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and everything came together yeah. finally in 2010 when I begged Dr. Robichek to let me, you know, take over as director and let me, let me re lead this and see what, you know, what can happen and trust me to, you know, to buckle do. down and do the work with him. And, you know, gave myself one year and, you know, just worked really hard. But, you know, giving back, it's, it's hard work, but it's such an honor to be able to give back to people who have little or nothing. And most of these folks have nothing. So it's so easy. It's easy to, it's easy to get out of the bed in the morning. So I will let you give me your perspective. What is this IMO organization? Why, you know, Dr. Robichek specifically talked about making sure that you don't just train them and leave them. Right. And you just don't go fix it and leave. You wanted to make sure that they are sustained, so you were actually training them. Is that what it is still today? In a nutshell, it is, here's the, the small synopsis of it. It's, we offer medical equipment and supplies to developing countries as well as educational opportunities. So not only are we delivering the tools to do the job, but we're also offering to the healthcare providers um, knowledge, which is invaluable. You know, you, yeah. you, it's invaluable. So Absolutely. that's the second component that makes it so successful. And talk and again, this is something he's been doing for years in the background. It just ramped up in the last six years. You know, you ask a question, how do I, did I have time? Yeah. You know, one thing makes me sick. If anybody said he doesn't have time, ah. you have time for everything you want to have time. And uh, let's say I was a quite busy cardiac surgeon, but it didn't stop me to make those trips. Yeah. And it didn't stop me to do a lot of other things. And anthropology was my hobby, but there are a few, few conditions, okay. you know. But at the first of all, you have to have somebody who helps you with your family. And that was you, my wife, yeah. who raised four children. Wow. And I have to admit, a little bit, I neglected them, but I was always there when I needed them. Yeah. Number two, live close to the hospital. Because if you commute, that's not life. That you are dead during this time when you commute. Right, you're wasting time. Then yeah. learn to sleep less. <laughs> and if you sleep less, you live longer. And you live longer while you are still young. You don't live longer when you are old. You want to live longer when you are young. Ah. And finally, don't play golf. <laughs> and that helps a lot. <laughs> so if you add all of this together, <laughs> You have time for everything. <laughs> what there is, I told you to work with the locals, that's elementary. Yeah. We are running a heart surgical program today in Belize. And there is a lonely heart surgeon who doesn't have any support. Wow. So we are in Belize practically every month, mm -hmm. a whole team from Charlotte, but he never done an operation. He's doing the operation, we are helping him. I am going to Guatemala for the last 40, 50 years. I never operated there, but I participated in dozens and dozens of heart, heart operation and chest operation. Mm -hmm. I helped the Guatemalan surgeons we trained in Charlotte. We trained about 60 Guatemalans, Hondurans, Belizeans, you name it. Wow. And Teresa maintains a guest house and they are come and go and come and go. Now it's more difficult than before mm -hmm. because of legalities. Sure, 
Sure. Can, so you do so have. We're sending uh, recently, just last week actually, yeah. uh, a team from Levine's Children's Hospital mm -hmm. went to Chimaltenango, Guatemala, and they were offering and provided uh, training to the providers there, the physicians and the nurses, you know, CPR, intubation, you know, I mean, they just, and so, and it's growing, it keeps growing exponentially. So, you know, I'm also now looking, we're looking at a physical therapist getting involved and in working in a center in Belize and in Guatemala. So, you know, the training is in country, the training is in Charlotte, it's, you know, it's pivotal me, to the success Let me though. ask you, Obviously, you saw a huge need for this. I, I want to make, make sure that we are clear on this. Um, the equipment, like Dr. Robichek has said, that you're using is the equipment that is already shelved. So tell me a little bit about it. So the equipment is generally the equipment that comes out of Carolina's healthcare mm -hmm. system yeah. is equipment that no longer supports the technology that we're currently using in the United States. Because we want to be number one in medical field. Correct. We need to have most up-to-date, most technology, you know. Cutting edge cutting everything. Cutting edge technology. Right, here. we want the okay. best of the best. And the United States proudly offers that. Absolutely, You know, yeah. we're, we're fortunate to be in that position. Mm -hmm. So yes, to be clear, the equipment that comes out of the hospital generally doesn't support the new technology. Um, it's end of life for oh. what we would consider in the United States. However, we can still get parts for that equipment. So when it is deployed into another country, if it breaks down, they can still for the next five to 10 years get the parts to make the repairs to the equipment. So, you know, there's still life in it. Yeah. It just doesn't meet our USDA standards. So yeah, sure. we... So you refurbish this and... Safety check it, make sure there check. are no kind of recalls, anything. So we have, we have so many partnerships. It's incredible. That, and how many people have jumped on board? I mean, we have engineers who help us. We have companies who, who help us, you know, not just with um, the equipment, but they also help us with the shipping. They help us with, I mean, it, it's, it's incredible. It takes it's, a village. It, Certainly, so takes it is a not village. just the foundation. It's not just IMO. No, it's just we, not the hospital. No, we receive grants. We receive significant support yep. from the Bissell Family Foundation, from the Dixon Foundation, from the Levine Foundation, and we have major projects which are supported by grants. Let me give you examples. We doubled the heart catheterization laboratories in Central America. Wow. We sent on seven. The Guatemala Heart Institute had a problem. They had a surgical capacity, mm -hmm. but they didn't have the patients. There was a gap between the patient and the Heart Institute. The patient, they were mostly native population. Took them six, eight hours to get back to the capital on top of buses and so on. Oh, wow. And there was no local diagnostics. So, we established echocardiographic laboratories, mm. trained the technicians. I have to say that to train the echo tech in the United States takes college and two years. Yeah. We trained the Guatemalan nurses in three months. Oh, oh wow. And <laughs> they take the pictures in the local little hospital, yeah. transfer it with the internet to Guatemala City. Mm -hmm. The cardiologist reads there. If the cardiologist wants consultation, we have a direct line with Carolina's Medical Center, wow. where the cardiologist uh, provide pro bono consultation. Okay. And now the system is working perfect. It increases like the number. You do video conferences and Once give advice. Yep. Yes. To yes. the uh, technicians we and the doctors over there. Finger fingertip away from them. That's amazing. Well, next week they'll have a video conference, another the monthly video conference with Guatemala, four o'clock in the afternoon. Dr. Jorge Alegria, he gets on there and they show in their images. We're showing our images. They're talking about wow. how complex these cases are. You know, um, there's been one or two cases that they're currently, you know, writing an article. The Guatemalans are writing the article for publication in a medical journal. And they, these are things and opportunities they. Wow. Just never have had But before. I think what I love most about this thing is all that equipment that we have and the resources that we have, you're not only utilizing them for extended life, 
oh, yeah. and then helping the underdeveloped, undeveloped, you know, countries to have a life there and to really, you know, bring and save lives there as well, and which is really huge. And I think from my perspective is also, we are not only helping abroad, but you are also really bringing Charlotte as a global leader, you know, helping other countries. I mean, you are really taking the name of our Charlotte community and the goodwill of the Charlotte citizens and the companies and organizations and foundations abroad. Let, let me tell you, if you go to Central America, everybody knows where is Charlotte. Wow. Yeah. But sometimes we hit some unexpected difficulties. Let me give you an example. Yeah. Uh, as I told you, we set up an echocardiographic network. Mm -hmm. And an echocardiographic machine, you know, it's as big as a, a refrigerator. Right. And whenever we got one there, there was a very nice reception. The governor of the uh, district came, mm -hmm. school children danced, there was music yes. playing, uh, the United States national anthem. Celebrations. And now yeah. we are in trouble because the echocardiographic machine is not that, that big. <laughs> Cost twice as much, but it's much smaller. It's and not so fancy this, for the media. Say, Thank you. you know? <laughs> and that was it. Because it's not so big anymore no. and it is right. smaller now. Exactly. And I know there are new initiatives, Teresa, that you talked about, about children or natal. Can you quickly tell me about the new initiative of this organization. So the focus, the focus now is not this year, but pro in, the, in the future, yeah. is um, neonatal intensive care units and pediatric intensive care units. And so we went to, uh, we went to a hospital in uh, Coban, Guatemala last year, and we saw the need. And we came back and we said, you know, we've got to get to work. We, this is a dire situation. There's nothing in these ICUs. They don't wow. have infant warmers, no incubators, wow. no uh, ventilators. It was just sad. Babies, and are, babies are in shoe boxes. Oh, basically. Painful. And mothers painful are sitting beside a bed that's actually an exam table that you wow. would see when you go to your primary care physician, yeah. sitting there with the baby day and night. Oh. And it's That's just hard. so heartbreaking. So yeah. this year, after we installed the intensive care unit in Coban, there was a 50% a 50 rate reduction. 50% decrease in infant in mortality. mortality. 50% decrease in infant mortality. If you, that is if, amazing. If you extend yeah. uh, the life of a neonatal intensive care unit yeah. for three years, it's about saving a baby for sixty dollars sixty dollars you can save a baby you know i know mike tarwater has started but just with the way it has been organized we don't have to worry about this you know whether you retire he retires no matter what the situation is it's going to go on i certainly hope so it, it will to. certainly it hope to. so it will and uh, so in one line tell me about this is a passion there's no question about this, okay? What has ignited this passion? Was it the need when you went and saw during your vacations, when you saw these people? You said, oh my gosh, I have to make a difference here and make more people live. Uh, you know, I believe that goodwill and volunteerism means a lot. But I also believe that professionalism is a leading factor. Mm. You want to board an airplane and the pilot comes on and said, I'm going to take these 200 wonderful people back to their loving family, get off the plane. <laughs> when a pilot comes on, he said, I'm a pilot, I'm going to fly you to Chicago and I fly you well because I'm a good pilot, stay on the plane. So it's a combination. And you have to have the goodwill. You have to give up some other things to do that. But the main force is I'm a surgeon. I have to do surgery. I understand. I'm a doctor. I have yes, to sir. help patients. I'm a health administrator. I have to make programs. Do your own job. 
I got you. And thank you so much for being on our show. And thank you for your service, Dr. Robotech. And thank you for your passion to get into this. And I think under your leadership as well, and under your leadership and guidance, you know, we're going to make big difference in the world. Charlotte stands <coughs> to save the world, you know, literally. So thank you so much for everything you're doing. And thank you for being on my show. It's a pleasure. Very much a pleasure. And thank you for watching Charlotte, a city of international success. I'm Dr. Maha Gingrich. Please join us again next time, right here on WTBI PBS Charlotte. of PBS Charlotte.